get started. Uh, we made it to the last lecture only today. We'll do a little overview of what we talked about after the spring break. And then on Wednesday is the reading day. So we don't have a lecture and the final exam is scheduled on Friday in person at 1030 in the same classroom. So just be aware that the, um, you know, uh, the, the exam time is earlier than a usual lecture time. Don't uh, don't come later. Um, okay, so I, I want to chat about the final exam a little bit. Uh, it's going to be, again, multiple choice, um, except one question. I will come to that. A good news, you, you, few of you were a little bit concerned about how you could maybe reach the maximum score you can get in this um, course right now. And to make things a little bit easier, I will we will have only questions that have one correct answer. And if you answer it correctly, you get the point, otherwise you do not. So it's easier and simpler than the midterm exam where we had multiple correct options and you were penalized if you uh, selected the wrong ones. Um, you will not be asked to um, solve any, yeah, I won't give you a sentence and ask apply CKI or the therapy or transition phase dependency parser on this example. Um, you still need to go over those algorithms because I might, might ask you questions about them, uh, but you will not be able to, you will not be required to actually do the computations yourself during the exam. Now, uh, this one, uh, one question that I mentioned will, that will be exception. Um, I noticed during the lectures, you had a little bit hard time when I asked you, okay, how would we design a neural network? And already then I told you that I'm recognizing this and that we will uh, test this out on the exam as well. Um, so I will ask you, I will tell you here, here is the type of a problem and you will design a neural network for this problem. You will need to specify what's the input to this neural network and a series of a computations to get to the output. So remember when we talk, you know, learned about one layer feed forward neural network, and I gave you a sequence of equations, more or less you will be asked to do something like that. Um, and here one particular, you had one particular issue and that was when the classification was not done at a sentence level, rather you had to determine whether two entities in a text are do they have certain relationship or whether if we don't want to use BIO notation, but we want to label a span, how we would do that. So uh, focus on these tasks where you don't do classification at the sentence level. And we have seen uh, many, many of those uh, since the spring break. And today on the blackboard, we are going to wor work through one of that uh, such examples just to see, you know, remind yourself, we are, this is something we have talked about. This is nothing new, but just as a practice, we'll do uh, one of these on the blackboard. Um, you, for a preparation for the exam, you should just go over the lecture slide. Like there is nothing else you need to uh, be doing from my point of view, but you have seen how the questions were at the midterm exam. They were not just about recalling facts. I didn't ask you what is nucleus sampling, rather I gave you a situation where nucleus sampling would be beneficial and you had to you know, do the reasoning step that that's where nucleus sampling could be beneficial. So while you're going through the, you know, um, through the slides, just try to think a little bit about what the implications of uh, things you are reading are. So don't, you know, I, I completed the reading list, uh, but you don't need to now go and read all the chapters. Those are only, if, um, as I said before, if you like, you know, if reading extra material is uh, easier for you to fill in all the gaps. Uh, that you see on the slides. Exams will cover only the second part of the semester, meaning everything after the spring break, but I will not ask you anything about the topics we talked about last week, which were multilingual, multimodal, large language models, and topics in responsible AI. So those will not be in the exam. Everything else may appear in the exam. And as in midterm, you can have one regular size note sheets, you can produce it in any way you like, uh, and it can have both front and back. And yeah, that's, I guess, everything I wanted to say about the exam. Do you have any questions? You will still have an hour and 20 minutes like you did for the midterm. 
Any any other questions? Yes, please bring the ID and we will be checking that. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay, so today we are going to do the little over overview, same as with the midterm. This overview just serves for us to remind ourselves literally topics we talked about because it's been a while since we, you know, um, were on a spring break. Um, this doesn't serve as a replacement for every single slide. So this is just a little quick tour of what we have talked about. Um, I also want to highlight that the final course feedback is now available. Um, and I want to remind you of two reasons why this is uh, important to us. It is important for us to hear uh, what kind of issues you have faced in this course and what would you like to see change in the future. Um, and it also helps us hear what is good in the course and we should not be changing. Otherwise, we make assumptions and then we uh, remove things you actually like. Um, I did introduce two questions at the end of this survey uh, to ask you about um, your opinions on the design of the course. I made specifically, which is more oriented toward applied machine learning rather than going deeper into linguistic phenomena. I would love to hear whether this is something you have actually enjoyed or not. There is no right answer here. It's just important for me to see whether uh, this restructuring of this NLP course here at Utah was good or it would be better to include more of the uh, language specific stuff. And I also ask those who have not taken machine learning course their experience uh, with this course because we are thinking about uh, introducing a lower level machine learning course and maybe having it as a requirement for this course. Uh, so hearing out how things worked out for you, would, would you able to in the end uh, manage this course uh, would be really uh, helpful for me uh, when I teach this course again in the fall. Remember, I also, I'm also i teaching this course for the first time, so there are, of course, many rough edges. So um, um, I'm not expecting that every one thing was perfect. So feel free to really say uh, what you think. And it's, of course, anonymized, so I can't know who is saying what. Of course, it impacts my evaluation as well. This is one of the three main components of my evaluation. And I like midterm feedback that's not considered for my evaluation, uh, the final feedback is. So uh, it is important for that as well. And to encourage you to submit this feedback, I will uh, still grant this uh, a little boost to your final grade, but only 80% or more of you submit the feedback, which was not the case for the midterm. So for whatever reason, I hope you will help me out by, you know, for the first two I think I mentioned here, but it would be really appreciative if we end up you know, uh, and, you know, finishing this lecture earlier today, then maybe uh, you can do it uh, here. But yeah, let's see how much time we have. Okay. Um, any questions about the logistics? Otherwise, I'm going to start with the overview. Yes. Uh, is the exam for an hour and 20 minutes or for two hours? Hour and 20. Yeah. There is, it's going to be easier than midterm, I would say. Maybe the only slight difference that is that one question. So our 20 is more than uh, enough. All right, so um, yeah. So after the spring break, we, oh, sorry. Just, I just want to that. Mm -hmm. Because I thought the final exam we had a two-hour window to complete. So are you going to like give us a hard job that like you cannot continue the exam after one hour 20 minutes? Well, that's what I was thinking, but I mean, if you think you need two hours, I don't mind sticking around. Like, yeah, I, mean, I think it's going to be become worse for you if you start changing things after hour and 20 minutes for about 10 ish multiple choice questions. You have to start uh, overthinking and it just becomes worse than, you know, in, in my opinion. But yeah, I hear you out. And if, um, um, if you think two hours would be beneficial, let's, let's have a two hour window and then I'm happy to stick around. So change <laughs> two hours for the exam from 10.30 to 12.30. Thanks for reminding me <laughs> of that. But I really think, I hope you don't even need hour and 20 minutes. Um, okay, so um, going back to the, uh, to you know where we started after we came back from the spring break, which was 
Before the spring break, we talked about large language models and we see how to do everything in end-to-end -end fashion, whatever application we had in mind. But then we kind of when return to uh, the idea of linguistic structure prediction where we solve tasks by predicting uh, certain uh, linguistic um, structures. And then based on the structures, we can make the final uh, decision. So for example, here we might tag, then parse, then do uh, NER and so on. And eventually we just might decide whether um, this document is positive or negative. And the first step in that was uh, the idea of part of speech tagging. And part of speech are these categories of words based on their grammatical relationship with neighboring words, such as this is a noun, this is a verb, uh, and so on. And uh, in morphologically rich languages, which have a lot of, let's say, suffixes, you can also say something about their grammatical role through those uh, morphological signs, which is not so relevant for English. And we approach the task of part of speech uh, tagging as a sequence labeling task. And sequence labeling is, um, you know, it's a family of uh, models for many, many, many uh, tasks, not just part of speech tagging, right? And the sequence uh, labeling in part of speech tagging means that we are given a sequence of tokenized words and a tag set. So that's our, our basically label set. And we need to label each word with an appropriate part of speech tag, which comes from the tag set, such as an N meaning the noun. Um, so this is an example. I will, I will keep showing you an example of this. I put a sentence, today students are looking back at everything they learned about NLP after the spring break. And here we have an example of an output of a part of speech tagger, where for each one of these uh, words here, we have um, and we have its part of speech tag. So uh, for example, uh, N and S I think is a plural form of a noun. Then we, um, the next thing we talked about were named entities. And named entities we kind of defined in a little bit um, vagueish way. Um, it is, we kind of vaguely refer to a name entity to be anything that can be referred to with a proper name. So most common for named entities are person, location, organization, or you know, um, location. And uh, unlike with the part of speech tags, we have seen one difficulty with named entities, and that's the fact that they are uh, often multi-word uh, expressions, such as New York City consists of three words. So it, we need to label this whole multi-word uh, expression with a single label, which is um, uh, a location. And the way we did that, was by introducing the BIO notation. Um, BIO notation, and it has an extension uh, with E and S, which I said is our list less used. Um, it's just an extension of our tag set, which where every possible tag, such as person, location, organization, is extended by adding these prefixes BIO, uh, excuse me, B and I meaning uh, beginning and inside of this entity, and then outside, outs O stands for outside. So for example, here uh, we have United Airlines Holding is an entity and it is an organization. It consists of three words. We are going to uh, here with the BIO notation, start B organization, inside organization and inside organization. So this is a problem of segmentation. And we have introduced the BIO notation to be able to approach uh, extracting and labeling named entities uh, as a sequence labeling task. We don't need to, every time we want to do named entity recognition, necessarily use uh, sequence labeling, but it's very often used for named entity recognition. So just to remind you, named entity recognition is as approach as a sequence labeling is the task where for, um, excuse me, just make sure there are, uh, is a, where we have a sequence of tokenized words and we have some set of possible entity tags. We'll label every single uh, word with an appropriate BIO uh, entity tag. Any questions about parts of speech tagging, named entity recognition that we have remembered now? 
Okay, and for example, here for the same sentence, um, we have two named entities, which are today is a date, uh, and then NLP is labeled here as organization, which is incorrect. NLP is not uh, an organization. And then if this was a really good named entity recognition uh, model, after the spring break, it would also probably label as a, as a date. So this is an example of an output of some named entity recognition model, but not a perfect one. And um, when we started, uh, you know, after the spring break, we started looking into some algorithms that are not neural algorithms. And one of them was hidden Markov model, where um, with hidden Markov model, I'll derive all of these things, uh, we have wanted to find the sequence of tags for our sequence of words uh, that maximizes the conditional probability of those tags given those words, and which is given by this uh, first equation uh, over here. And then uh, we did a sequence of uh, computations uh, here, um, such as the here we use the Bayes rule. Then we said, okay, uh, this uh, denominator that is not there is no you know symbol t here, meaning this doesn't depend. So maximization uh, is um, is uh, you know maximizing uh, this part is the same as maximizing uh, this whole fraction. Um, and then we have used two assumptions we have made. Namely that uh, here we use the uh, Markov assumption and we have used all the, the uh, excuse me, here we use the Markov assumption and here we use the output independence um, assumption. And when we did that, we got this sequence of equations and then we have just introduced new symbols to um, denote the conditional probability of words given tags and the conditional probability of a current tag given a previous tag, which we called with a B and A uh, retrospectively. And also this was the initial uh, probability of a tag. So to find the uh, max, uh, the, the best basically sequence of tags given our sequence of words, we need to find sequence of tags that maximizes this uh, this uh, probability, uh, this um, equation over here. And then uh, we didn't really go into the serious computations. I have forced you to trust me that this is the case that if we do just relative frequency counting for our initial probabilities and our transition and emission probabilities, I said this is these probabilities estimated like these, like this are gonna maximize the probabilities that we, this equation over here. So um, hidden Markov model is basically a model that does this, that uh, finds a sequence of tags by finding the sequence of tags that maximizes this equation and the um, initial and emission and transition probabilities, as you have also calculated in your fourth homework, are those that can be computed by counting from a corpus where we have um, uh, labeled um, sentences with their tags. So we did that, and great. Now we have no neural approach to finding a maximum, you know, the sequence of tags maximizes uh, that, uh, that equation but we were unhappy with how slow that's gonna be uh, because here we have this equation that require us to, for every possible sequence of tags, to calculate this value over here, which we can do. Nothing prevents us from doing that. It just means we need to, for every single possible sequence of these tags, um, put certain numbers. The issue here is that there are just so many of these possible um, sequence of tags, and that becomes too slow to just, um, you know, put uh, all these numbers for all those sequences of, of tags, which then brought us to the Viterbi algorithm, which is a dynamic programming algorithm that helps us do this inference faster. Namely, find the, uh, given these values, P, A, and B, it, uh, it enables us to find the sequence of tags that maximizes this equation faster which you also have um, try out in the, in the homework for. Okay, uh, so that's our first, you know, non neural algorithm for sequence labeling focused on part of speech tagging and name identity recognition. But then we uh, moved into uh, looking into deeper structures. Namely, we have started to look into uh, parsing. 
And first parsing uh, we have looked into was constituency parsing that breaks down sentence down into its con constituents parts, where constituents are words that kind of belong together in when you look at uh, uh, at a sentence, like something that can function as a single unit within within a hierarchical structure, such as, uh, for example, verb phrase ran to the building functions as a single unit within this um, sentence. Um, and we said, okay, this works for English, although it doesn't work for all languages because in some uh, languages where the order of words is a little bit more flexible than the idea of what is like, not everything that appears very closely together, um, um, excuse me, not everything that functions as a unit necessarily is close to each other in a sentence. Um, and then I will not go over CKI algorithm again, but CKI algorithm was another dynamic programming algorithm we have introduced to basically populate a table like this, which gave us all possible uh, constituency trees for a single sentence. And then if we applied CKI to probabilistic CFGs, we could also have the ability to find the highest probable uh, constituency parts three among all of the possible. Now, question for you, why, uh, why is it the case that it, it's possible to have multiple uh, parse trees for a given, uh, given sentence? Why there isn't only a single one? Yes. Uh, the yeah, exactly. We have seen at least four different kinds of ambiguities where given a single sentence, we can see how we can derive different parse trees. So there is ambiguity and grammar allows for more than a single uh, parse tree. Therefore, to resolve this ambiguity, we had uh, CKI, and then we applied it to probabilistic CFGs to get the highest scoring one, which we predict uh, in the end. Um, and then for the same sentence we have seen before, uh, this is the gigantic constituency parse tree, uh, where, um, for example, I don't know, uh, here we have uh, a, a noun phrase students, which uh, which makes sense, and uh, PP after the spring break, for example. All right, so that was our that was our constituency part three. But then in the same week, we have also introduced another grammar formalism, and we talked about another way to get the syntactic structure out of the sentence based on a different formalism. So constituency formalism was being uh, based on phrasal constituents and phrase structure rules. But in the new grammar uh, formalism, in dependency formalism, we have focused on the syntactic structure of a sentence described in terms of the relationship between the words. Um, not any relationships, but grammatical relationship between words. So for example, if you have here main word scratched, then the cat and scratch have, uh, there is a relationship between them, and the cat is the subject of the word, a verb scratched. And similarly, couch is in a grammatical relationship object with uh, the verb scratch, meaning um, couch is the object of scratch. Yes. Uh, so this is now that constituency parsing works by looking for phrases of words that are close together, and dependency uh, parsing does not look for mm -hmm. such structure. Can we say that dependency parsing is more suitable to language describe a word or there is more Exactly. That's the right uh, right uh, right inference to make. And I see you're already following my suggestion to not only recall the facts, but think about what are the uh, implications of this. So dependency formalism, because now um, if, uh, for example, in German, a verb and the subject can be super far from each other, like they can be on a beginning and end of the sentence, then um, then you have only a single dependency relation between them, but there can be like 10 words in between them. So in constituency parse three, they would be very far from each other. And we have seen that with an example in the slides when we introduced dependency parsing, um, whereas with the dependency parsing, that would be just like one link away. And then uh, we introduced one, we went into, you know, in detail some one of the ways to do with the dependency parsing, namely transition-based dependency parsing, which I will not try to now go into, you know, uh, illustrate again, um, recording is available 
Um, but here we just introduced three operation, left arc and a right arc and a shift. And based on these operation and working with the second buffer, you would uh, do this uh, operation to collect the, the dependencies uh, along the way. And eventually you will get all of the dependencies and then you would use them to reconstruct a tree out of them. So for example, for uh, the same sentence, this is an example of dependency uh, parse tree where, um, I don't know, let's see. You can see that some of the words are in a relation which are pretty pretty far away. For example, learned and break, for example, here. I honestly don't know what OBL stands for, but you can see how the connection can be uh, pretty far away from uh, each other. All right, so that was about parsing and we kind of then finished with syntax and we started to move into semantics, which is a discipline that cares about meaning. Uh, what does words and sentences mean? We have seen when we talk about embeddings all the way at the beginning of this course, uh, a little bit about lexical semantics, but this is semantics is just not, it's not just about a meaning of single words, but rather of whole pieces. And I've introduced this task of semantic parsing where the goal is to turn your utterance, your sentence into a logical form, a machine readable a representation of a meaning of the sentence that a machine could parse. And I think the easiest example we have seen of this is when we give an instruction to a robot and then a robot has some primitive uh, grammar and set of instructions it can follow, we produce a sequence uh, of those um, actions to, to give it to the robot. And then, um, the idea behind semantic parsing is to give this very full representation of the meaning. So it must be very extra specific. However, that's really hard. And we have seen another way to kind of double into this, which is way more shallower, meaning we don't really recover the um, with this representation of meaning, the full meaning of the sentence, but rather some aspects of this meaning. And specifically, we talked about uh, semantic, excuse me, I don't know why this is an owl scrambled, um, but we talked about uh, semantic roles. Given a predicate, which is usually verb in a sentence, we have uh, talked about how to um, find different arguments of that verb. Uh, so for example, here, if the uh, sentence is John saw Mary eat the apple, there is a verb so, meaning there is the action, an event of seeing something. And you might ask questions such, which entity is performing this seeing action? And that would be John in the sentence. And you might ask what is being seen? And then the answer would be Mary eat the apple. Um, this task is called semantic role labeling. Um, which is loosely defined as um, labeling in a sentence who does what to whom, when, and where. Uh, it is all oriented around the verb. So you need to have a sentence and the verb, and then given that sentence and a verb, you label spans in the uh, sentence that are arguments of this uh, verb, such as uh, here John was the actor of seeing action, and the Mary was uh, eating the apple was um, agent of this action. All right, and um, long story short, this brought us to an end-to-end -end approach to doing um, semantic role labeling, which is again approach as a sequence labeling task, meaning we, for every word or talk token, we use the BIO notation because, um, Let's go back here. Uh, which span here needs the BIO notation? Yeah. Mary eat the apple. Exactly. So Mary eat the apple is an argument which consists of multiple words, and we need to give it uh, this whole span a label. But if you are doing a semantic row labeling as a sequence labeling task, uh, then we need to in some way say, well, Mary eat the apple, you all are part of the same argument and you all are gonna get this same label, which is uh, argument zero in ProBank semantic row labeling. So as soon as we have multi-word expression, we and we approach the task as a sequence labeling task, we need the BIO notation. 
or will likely use BIO annotation to help handle this. Um, if your task, and maybe I'll come back to this, um, I don't want to confuse you too much, but here uh, also the there is no overlapping argument, so each word will get just a single uh, label. If uh, we want you to do constituency parsing, which we can as a um, sequence labeling kind of thing, we, we wouldn't use the BI orientation, which may be something we can also work out on the uh, Blackboard. Right, so this is why we use uh, BI notation. What else was special here when we were doing semantic role labeling? I will give you a hint by reminding you that input is a sentence and a word, and we are using an end-to-end -end approach. If I, again, remind you that the input is a sentence and a verb, what do we need to do? Let's say we have two verbs in this sentence. What will happen? Okay, go. Like combine, combine what together? Um, a sentence and a verb, but verb already is in the sentence. Exactly, yeah. So if we had two verbs, like in the sentence, um, I kept showing you today, students uh, are going, are looking, whatever, what you learned, you have both looking back and uh, learning verbs. And if I ask you who did, like who is looking and who, you know, what are you looking at or who is learning and what are you learning, you will get different arguments. So um, the to to do this task with an, in this approach, you need to specify which word are you interested at the moment. And the answer is actually written here. We have this indicator which says this is the uh, this is the verb I'm interested in learning the arguments uh, of right now. So for the SRL, you need to specify what the verb is. And you also need to use the BIO uh, notation. Um, and then we have also seen, you know, how we could use BERT. And BERT, for example, um, where here uh, we had to use something. I didn't go into details of this, and you don't really need to know how exactly are we specifying the verb. But you can introduce another vector that's going to be always zero if, um, um, you know, uh, it's not a verb we are interested in and it's going to be all once if we are interested in that verb. And maybe then we sum the embedding of that wor word, like here, love, and uh, this uh, special vector, which is either zero or once. And in this way, uh, it is changed. The, the, the embedding is changed a little bit and then that signals to the rest of the network. With BERT, it's easier because we have these special tokens. So instead of adding any vectors to the token embeddings, Instead, we just use the separator tokens and we place them around the verb we are interested in at the moment. So uh, we indicate which verb by putting these separator tokens, unlike in 2017 when we use these vectors that we would sum with the word embeddings. Okay, and then for the, the same example I have, I'm bringing up, this would be how the semantic row labeling output would look like. Here we have uh, two verbs. One is look, looking, and the other one is learning. So um, this uh, the output of some semantic row labeling model here is that today's students is uh, is who is looking, which is wrong, right? Uh, here, what should be the right um, argument? Just students, right? And then we have looking back here, this means that this modifies the looking uh, in some way, which is fine. Um, and then what is being looked at, uh, everything they learned about NLP, blah, blah, blah. This is uh, correct, right? And then we have the verb learn, uh, who, students, uh, that's, that's right. And then uh, here is um, A1, what is being learned uh, about NLP and then this modifies um, about NLP, which is right NL about NLP after the spring break. 
So this is an example of uh, an output of SRL. Here it's pretty, you know, our output looks um, a little bit funky in a sense that you get this vertical representation. This is just a visualization choice. Here it's important to remember that the input to a neural network is a sequence of these uh, tokens of the words, and then the output is a sequence of these labels. So here we would have uh, beginning A0 inside A0 uh, O, uh, uh, beginning verb, uh, beginning AM, AM dir, beginning A1, inside A1, inside A1, all the way to the back. That would be uh, the output of the uh, neural network for this uh, specific verb uh, in this example. Um, any questions about SRL? Yeah. Uh, for the second one, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how do you identify that the subject is student? Uh, do you do a co distribution on the word dates? Uh, I don't know what this model is, to be honest. I just wanted to use some demo. Um, so, but you are right that the um, there is some co-reference here and um, it's not necessarily still the case that the model understands that they and students uh, refer to the same thing, right? So uh, I guess uh, if the if the if some model labeled both students and they as uh, a zero, although this is not something that's possible, I think in the current schema you can't have two a zeros. Um, then maybe you would hypothesize that it might understand the reference. Um, I think it's possible to say they are a zero or learn without understanding reference here. So ideally it understands, but um, that's not something we know for sure. Which brings us to co-reference, right? Which is the task of uh, determining uh, whether two mentions co-refer, whether they refer to the same entity. Uh, so here we had this uh, little made up story by GPT-4 about Taylor and Morgan. And then uh, the goal of co-reference resolution is to produce co-reference chain or clusters. For this uh, specific example, that would be uh, three, three chains or three clusters, Taylor, her, and 20 year old. Morgan and her, Taylor and Morgan co-referring with they. Um, and we said that co-reference resolution is a compromise from two subtasks. One is to identify mentions, which is, uh, we said, easier because there is just a smaller set of possible uh, mentions. And uh, the other harder part is uh, actually given potential mentions, cluster them into a co-reference chain. So let's say in the first step, you have everything which is highlighted here in the color or any kind of styling is the output of a step one here. Uh, and then the second one would be to actually group them uh, in these clusters. Um, and we have seen two ways how to go about them. And this one of them was mentioned ranking model, uh, where given uh, some anaphores, meaning a mention that has an antecedent uh, and a candidate antecedent, we had to say uh, uh, which is the highest scoring uh, antecedent. So uh, given all antecedent, which one is the highest scoring? Um, here we use neural mention ranking algorithm, and I want to go over the details of this. I find this to be important for you to know how would you use neural network when we are not just doing the, you know, just the classification at the top of it. So here, as I said, we have two subtasks, uh, finding mentions, and then giving the mentions, deciding which one are uh, should be placed together uh, or not. So here, um, illustration shows mentions up to three words long in actual implementation of this end-to-end uh, -end co-reference model. You can have spans that are up to 10 words long. And uh, first thing you do, and the first thing you almost always do is get a little bit more complex representation of your input words. Uh, for BERT and transformer, we have seen that's the output of the last encoder block that's highly contextualized word representation of every single token in the input. So whatever your encoder here is, be it a transformer from, you know, trained from scratch, a pre-trained transformer or some other architecture, you get uh, as the output, 
some new representation of every single token in the input. And usually you want to work with those because remember one of the first lectures we have on neural network basics when I was showing you those animations where something that's not separable in a linear you know, space, if you make lots of nonlinear transformations, you transform your uh, inputs into something where you can separate them. So that's the goal of having more complex representations coming from a sequence of nonlinear operations in the encoder. So once you have that, um, you have your uh, hidden representation for each one of the tokens. And now this seemed to be a tricky part to um, really embrace. You need a representation of a span. And span can be, for example, here, three tokens long. But you cannot have three separate vectors because what neural networks are, as we have seen, bunch of matrix vector computations. They are not computations of a matrix with a set of vectors, right? So the goal here is to produce a representation of these three vectors, one representation, one vector that represents the whole span. And there are multiple choices for that. For example, here they have taken the representation of the first token in the span, the representation of the second token in the span. And they have also used the attention mechanism to find out which one of these three is the most uh, important and then do the uh, weighted average of these three such that the one which is the most important is you know, being captured in the average the most. And then they have these three representations that they concatenate. It's always almost the, the case that you are concatenating something. You could be averaging them, but averaging is... Um, hasn't been the, the, the most common choice. You could do that. Not, no one prevents you from trying it and it might work, but very often people are concatenating this. It's important to also remember that here, although we are illustrating only spans of two and three, they might be up to 10 tokens long. So the idea of concatenating each of these that make the span is not a good idea because you will have then let's say the dimensionality of each is D. For spans that are two tokens long, you would, by concatenating every token in the span, you will get a representation two times D. But if you have 10 tokens, then you will get 10 times D representation. But in the end, you want to use same matrix to multiply as, uh, with, uh, to use, it, to use uh, for multiplication with the span representation. So here you can do many things, but in the end, whatever thing you use, you must end up with um, the same dimensional representation for every single span, regardless of the length of that span. And you might want to remember that averaging might be fine, but that very often people have used concatenation of the first and let's say ending span, and then maybe some special thing as well. Here in this work, they use this attention. Very often people just use the element-wise product between the first and the last token. Okay, once you get the representation of a span, you are interested to know whether this is a mention or not. So you can just do a binary classification, for example, or if you just want to get one score, you can approach it as a regression. And once you have that, you have your mentions, then uh, for each mention, which is initially every possible span, uh, for every possible combination of two spans, you want to determine whether they are co-referring or not. So now again, we have a similar situation. We have span one and its representation, and we have span two and its own representation. And again, this is two vectors, but we want to have one vector. So what could we do, for example, to decide whether they are co-referring or not? Again, sometimes there is some problem. Mm -hmm. but that is yeah, and here we always have two spans. So just concatenating these two would be perfectly fine. And then again, we have a single vector that represents these two spans. We do the vector and or the other uh, operations to decide whether they qualify or not. And for example, in that example, we have Kipsi, 
we would, with a good co-reference model, it would place a link between students and they, because these two mentions co-refer. They are both referring to all of you in this case. Okay, so um, I want to go over probing a little bit, and then I'm going to stop. Uh, we I still want to talk about applications, but then we are going to just try this exercise uh, which we basically verbally have done right now. You know, we, we talked about how do we um, combine, you know, vectors to get a single vector to do something, but we're going to write it down on the blackboard to really uh, remember uh, how to do this. And, but before we go into all of that, I just want to remind you that once we finished with co-reference that brought us to the last point of our linguistic structure prediction. And, um, and then we talked about idea of probing, how large language models or language pre-trained language models are not trained to do any of this. They're not trained to predict part of speech tags, named entities, uh, semantic roles, co-reference, uh, parse trees, and so on. But there is um, a notion that if they are able to you know, do a summarization, answer questions, and so on. All of these applications where we deem you need to understand, you need to resolve those structural ambiguities, for example, then they implicitly must have learned some of these linguistic uh, phenomena. And the way we, we, I mean, the community has tested this is through idea of probing, where you take a contextualized word representation from some pre-trained model, and then you forgot about the model that produced it, and you develop a simple linear probe or maybe one layer, one peep over neural network to see whether you can predict some linguistic phenomena based on just that representation alone. So you forget all of the other parameters of the model, you just use the representation. So for example, uh, you want to know about part of speech tags, you take the um, word, you get the represent contextualized representation of each one of the verbs, words, and then you use a linear model to predict the part of speech tag of every single one of these uh, words. And then you would say, if you do that successfully, that some notion about grammatical role is captured in representations by uh, BERT. And in that lecture, I put the slides in the, um, but they're both from the website and website links are now, they should all be complete and updated. So, you know, if you if you see anything broken, let me know. But the uh, you should go back to the slides of that lecture to just see what kind of tasks like pairwise labeling, span labeling we have uh, talked about, because that's again, I, something I deem relevant that you that you know. Okay, let's now stop here um, with, um, with presentation for a moment. We'll come back to it. Uh, and then uh, let's on the blackboard work out one of these, uh, let's say pairwise uh, labeling examples. Um, let me just see, can I do this? Oh, great. Okay, so let's say we have this example. Um, so the task is going to be some kind of, um, okay, people in the back, do you see this? You see? So, so, let me try maybe making it larger. I have very small handwriting, so that's, that's it. And the um, pairwise labeling, meaning, um, uh, let's say we have this sentence. Um, Obama is the former president. Um, 
president. Um, and the task is to predict whether two mentions, let's say here, Obama and president um, refer to the same entity in the real world. Um, okay. Does anyone want to try this on the board? Uh, by try this, I mean um, give a sequence of equations needed to uh, get from the input all the way to the output uh, of a model that predicts given two possible um, spans in the input, whether they like, they are in some relation or not. Anyone feels brave? I will help you out. Mm -hmm. It's a, I, I'm asking just because uh, I will probably go way faster than any of you. So that's a good forcing function to be very slow. Yeah. Come. Okay. And um, just to be clear, the inputs are not two mentions, rather the input is this whole uh, sentence. Um, Maybe, yeah, go one, two, one, one. Okay. So I'm going to start from the top and go down. And okay. I'm remembering the slide I was just on. I'm starting with tokens. Mm -hmm. Obama is the mm -hmm. president. Nice. Okay. So these uh, get encoded. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Can we uh, make it just a little bit more specific? I will delete this before we place it in the encoder. Okay. What do we use? Um, we need to, I forget what it's called. We need like. Use whatever word that comes to your mind. I know uh, I know word to vec is relevant here, but I forget what the input staff puts a word to vec on. We turn these into numbers, the words into numbers first of like yeah, indexes. That's that's true. Um and then given each index, uh we do the next uh, operation, which is what can what, what do we place into models? We need features or representations. Representations. Yeah. And you mentioned word to vec, so that's yes. great. Let's let's oh, assume we are tells me the inputs and outputs here. Yeah. So word to vec uh, of um uh, Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, word to back of is word to back of the the word to back of former and president is the first thing. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So okay. That, uh, let's see. This is not the encoding. This is the representation. Yeah. So these are just oh, fixed. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, an encoder could be like a transformer. I don't know if there's a specific named architecture, mm -hmm. it, but it could just be a transformer encoder, which is like, oh, I can't, I can't remember what goes inside that. Or yeah, that. so it's a little bit more complex. Um, let's maybe keep things simple. And you can also, in your exams, keep things simple. Let's say we just use one, one layer feed forward neural network. So we have okay. linear and non-linear transformation of this vector. So if you if you remember how to, and I'll help you out, write the equ actual equation. Let's call this um, maybe E as for embedding. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe let's use subscript to denote the location we are at right now. So that would be E. Yeah. All these zero. Yeah. That's a zero. Okay. The equation is we have a nonlinear in there somewhere. I'll start with that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I've got two linears on either side, if I, if I remember correctly. So I think one of those is going to go on the inside, and one of those is going to go on the outside. Mm, yeah, so maybe let's ignore this one for a moment. Uh, this okay. one. And this stands for. This one is linear. Linear transformation. Mm -hmm. There's some learned matrix that we multiply by yeah. the input. So that's, that's right. Do you want me to write that instead of this? I would prefer that you, yeah, write the okay. actual uh, equation. So W to O. 
And just for the completion, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, let's just stop for a moment to make sure everyone understands what's happened here. So, the first thing we did is uh, transform every single token into a vector. You know, we always place vectors to neural networks, that always must be the first thing. So, we are embedding everything here with some fixed representation, and we have chosen where to look, which is great. Now, um, I said, let's use as a model, as an encoder feed forward neural uh, network, which means that we have a linear transformation first, which is always just a vector uh, matrix product. And this matrix is gonna be trainable. We are trying to learn the right linear projection. And then um, this is gonna be, let's introduce some also uh, numbers. Here are D1. And let's say this one is R D2 times D1. So this one is going to be dimension of what's D2? That's a new dimension of this uh, matrix is uh, D2 times D1. I I just decided it's going to be it's a hyperparameter. Right. Yeah. So the product of these will give us vector of which size? D2, right? Okay. And then uh, we have this vector, and then we apply some nonlinearity. For example, which one do we like? So it's basically the one which looks like this, right? It's a it's a zero it's zero for negative values. Um, and we apply element wise to this vector. Okay, good. So now we have, let's give this a name. How would you call this new new vector? Uh, this is a encoding. No. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes. one, whatever symbol you want to use it, don't use E because you have it right. for your embeddings. Uh, so just any symbol. Yeah. And one. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. That goes here. That's. That. Mm -hmm. that. Okay. Um, encoding. Okay. And just to remind you what we are doing, we have a sentence. Now you have produced a non linear representation of each token. Yep. But we are interested whether two tokens core, like, are in some relation or not. Okay. So I want to, I realize I'm working off the wrong slide because I'm thinking of the. Uh, I think this was the sequence tagging one, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I'm just going to go ahead and stop me if I get something wrong. Okay. Um, so I want to, this is pairwise, I want to combine adjacent uh, encodings somehow. Mm -hmm. So and, I, I don't necessarily be, need to be um, adjacent. Um, I'm interested in, in any two tokens, whether they are in relation or not. So do you specify you you specify these two? And do you does that come into the model as like no a number or um no but you are at the right track except um you just made it a little bit too specific. You said adjacent instead of adjacent we will just try all combinations. So uh for the first one and second and first one and third and the so we just we just have a much yeah. larger exactly okay. yeah sorry I didn't see this yeah okay so Obama and President uh come <laughs> like mm -hmm. here um I want to concatenate those two mm -hmm. nice. So now uh, I would appreciate if you um, tell us a little bit about dimensions. So okay. you have concatenated this and you have mm -hmm. produced a vector of which size? Okay. This is uh, on real vectors of size two D two. Perfect. D two twelve. And now we need to decide whether those in are in a relationship or not. Yes. So we are doing the output linear layer. So maybe let's give a symbol to this one and then yeah. we'll give us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I got to transform this. So my first thought is to just do this again. Mm -hmm. uh, put it directly from my Yeah, just pay attention to the size of the matrices you're introducing. That's what I'm interested in. Cool. So uh, that's going to be ReLU of another matrix, dx uh, times this thing, mm -hmm. and then five. And so X has got to be the output from here is uh like a log probability or something of mm -hmm. how likely these are linked. Is that right? How likely they are um core uh, in relationship or not. So that's just one the limit. Yeah. Uh, which means I want my product to be a tiny number. My input is you like. Yeah. No, wait, I'm getting this wrong. No, you, you're, you're right. Like, uh, you, you want to estimate this. You want to have a single number here. And uh, this must come from this product, right? The mm -hmm. single number. So write down the dimensionality of X such that when multiply with the vector of this dimension, you get a single number out. Right. And this is, uh, it's oh, like 2 d 2 by 1. Mm -hmm. uh, which means if there's just one number, then this is, I feel like this is wrong because I want a big matrix before I crunch it down, but this would be just the opposite, like one times two to two. That's right. And, and the reason why you're slightly confused is because usually I write this down as a binary classification. So we have here two times two times D2, but what you have here is completely right. It's more like a regression. You're trying to find a single score. There is nothing wrong with that, uh, but maybe the reason why this is slightly different than what we have seen before is because you can have two times two d two uh, as a dimension of x, and then you would get a two dimensional vector, which is one is for they're in a relationship, and the other value in this vector is not in a relationship. Okay, but you you have just a single number, the score of being in a relationship, which is fine. Okay. And then that just gives a number, and this thing is just R. Yeah. And maybe that's like 0 0.7 or something. Yeah. So to get something like this, we do need a few changes. So okay. usually when we have output layer, we don't have the nonlinearity anymore. We are just um, we just try to get the unnormalized versions. But um, let's say we have two times D two here. What what is the um, what is what is the operation that gives you the notion of probabilities? I want to say the layer normalization goes here. I don't know if that's what's responsible mm. for what you're talking about. Though. Mm, not this one. Um, it, it has other purposes in transformer, but here I'm interested in squashing two zero and one. Squashing zero and one. Uh, soft max. Exactly. Be yeah, that's like it's one of these, right? Where you've got that function. In it, yeah, softmax generalizes to higher dimensions of you know um, something like that. Yeah, which would be a sigmoid. Okay. So yeah, so here we just have softmax. So the softmax there, and that's actually gives the, something reasonable, like like what yeah. I guess it's now it's two. Mm -hmm. row yeah. Row. yeah, and the other one would be 0.3. Mm -hmm. And that's it, right? Now we have the whatever is the highest scoring one is the one we predict. Is the do we have to do normalization to get the other one 0.3? Uh that's what the softmax is for. Softmax okay. is uh squashing to zero and one and normalizing. That's its purpose. Yeah. And that's it. All Great. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go. Thank you. Um, okay, so we made it. Um, question. Uh, do we also need contextualization here? Because if we have another sentence where President Biden and Obama are not, not very mm -hmm. related, for example, President Biden met with Obama. Yeah, so contextualization always helps, right? And this is the reason why we now always use contextualized and pre trained language models. 
Um, I will ask you to do this in the exam. So you do not want to make it extra complex for you. You want to stick with the feet forward and lower left for here because otherwise you need to remember how to write the equations for the transformer, which I don't know, maybe you feel comfortable with. It's not super complicated, but it's easy to mess up. I think another reason why you want to stick with the one layer non one layer fit forward neural network is because I will ask you the number of trainable parameters in the end. So here, um, actually, I will not ask you count immediately. Tell me which. Um, uh, which, what are the, in this whole um, situation, what are the trainable parameters here? Um, maybe it would be helpful for me to write down the equations sooner. Um, so we have um, input is going to be a sequence of tokens. Uh, so let's say we have P. Is P one all the way to P uh, capital N? That's our sentence, tokenized uh, sentence. Uh, then we have E of P I is gonna be um, fixed embedding or static embedding. And here options are word to web, for example, or we mentioned blah. The next step here was the nonlinear transformation of our static embedding, which was called N, uh, NI, was W uh, arrival of W0 times EI. I'm going to simplify this by saying EI is the static embedding. Okay. And here we have introduced V0 to be uh, V2 times D1 dimensional matrix. And static embeddings are D1 dimensional. That was one operation. And then our final operation was to get uh, the uh, probabilities, which um, are called here P, uh, which was just these softmax of x times n i. And I will write here p i will be the probabilities for, uh, oh, sorry, I missed step up. We have also introduced the um, n i j was a concatenation of N I and N J, which is element of R D two, two times D two. This is element of D two. Okay, and then we have probability of I and J for being in relationship being stop max. Uh, of, and here I will write X times um, N I J, which is where X is element of two times two D two. Okay, so these are the equations, and this is something you will you should be able to produce for the exam. Now, given this. Which, what are, what symbols here refer to trainable parameters? W0 x. Mm -hmm. W0 x. Um, here, why these ones are not trainable? Or are they trainable? Mm -hmm. That's true. So here, if we started with random ones, uh, they would also be trainable parameters. Actually, not, nothing stopped us from changing the uh, embeddings as well, despite them being coming from 
a pre-trained model were to work here. So you will need to also specify for whether these are trainable or not. So here, um, I will write E. E is an uh, embedded matrix of the size uh, vocal times uh, D1. Whether this is trainable or not is your decision, right? All right, so now I am interested in the number of trainable parameters. Mm -hmm. D2 times D1, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Four times D. Mm -hmm. I will just write it like this to not confuse anyone. And then optionally we have, I will do like this, Volca times D1. All right. And again, this is something you will need to uh, do in the exam. Do not mm, specify the values of the symbol. I find it really hard to how to tell you that in a written form. So I said something like, give me symbols, not concrete numbers. That's what I mean. Like, don't introduce now this is 100, this is 50, this is 30. I, I'm not interested in this. I want to see that you are able to notice which one are trainable, what's their size, and how from that we determine the number of uh, parameters. Yes. What is it? Uh, capital P here? No, right below trainable parameters. Uh, uh, this one? Yeah. Oh, this is just a count of uh, trainable parameters. So, yeah, P, P. Oh. I'm being lazy to write the whole thing again. Yeah. Yeah. So I can see that you subscribed to W0. Um, are there cases where we use a different W for each? Um, for each um, no. Okay. So I see you all taking photos of this. I will write this down for you in a nice form. So uh, please <laughs> chill. Uh, I don't want to be on any of these photos. Um, here, W0 will always be, we would say, it, uh, these are uh, shared parameters to so always apply. Otherwise, remember, first of all, these would be uh, variable sequences. So then how would you implement it, right? Like we would have arbitrary number of them and there is no reason to do that, right? Like they are shared and um, this matrix is specialized to produce nonlinear representation of each token. This matrix is specialized to give a score for two, uh, two potential entities uh, here. So these parameters are always gonna be shared in any kind of neural network across tokens and here across pairs of tokens. Um, the choices of how we call this, um, I, you know, uh, V0, uh, w, uh, w0 here might be confused with WO, which would be more common to use for output player. Um, so yeah, don't get fixated on the, how we actually name these. I just call them whatever was introduced, but you can call this however you want. I do recommend sticking with not mixing W and X uh, because W reminds us of weights. So it's nice to call them uh, with something which is still W something. Yes. What is case? I'm sorry, may I repeat that? What is case? X is the output matrix. Which uh, here, so this is a this is a vector, and now given that vector that represents i and j, whatever i and j token are, uh, you want to determine given their joint representation, which we have produced by concatenating their representations, whether they are in a relationship or a not. So this can be framed as a binary classification task. So we have two labels in a relationship or not, which is why we have two here. And then this is the dimensionality of the shared vector. Uh, so two here is the number of classes we have for our task. And then you apply softmax, which takes every value in this vector, squashes it between zero and one, and normalizes that we have a notion of uh, probability distribution. So this is 
this here is something we have introduced when um, we talk about feed forward neural network, which was um, one of the prior lectures. So I also recommend going back to that lecture, which was in the first part of the semester, if that's unclear, but um, this is just getting the output predictions. Yeah. No, don't don't need to review transformers. Yeah, I'm actually confused with um, we are actually tokenizing the mm -hmm. engines, then uh, feeding it to the uh, bit for a neural network. Uh -huh. So first we are doing near linear transformation, then uh, concatenating it, then uh, sorry. Uh, linear transformation, mm -hmm. then uh, non linear transformation, then concatenating uh, the store, and then we are really doing the softmax. But uh, we are doing the softmax on the concatenated mm -hmm. vector. So I understand that MIJ part, but uh, I didn't understand where is the X. X, uh, X is some, it's, a, it's a trainable weight matrix you have introduced to get from a vector. So you need to predict whether this vector that represents the joint representation of two entities, mm -hmm. two tokens, whether they are in relationships. So how do you go from a high dimensional vector into a prediction? You need to predict um, you know, what the probabilities of being in a relationship or not are. And you do that by doing the output classification, which means defining the weight trainable matrix that downsizes your highly dimensional vector of dimension 2d2 into just two numbers for relationship or not relationship. So this is what x is doing. Uh, if it's confusing that this is x, you can call it uh, w1. And it's the same, it's the same spirit as this one. Oh. Yeah. I think maybe that's confusing because X's are commonly used for activations, um, which here, yeah, just to make sure. Um, also, if it's unclear, we are doing this for every possible, this one, yeah. everything that's here is done for every possible I pair I J. So yeah. that's why we have these arrows because we are doing that for every single one of them. So these computations are going to be repeated as many pairs we have uh, uh, in, you know, between tokens in the input. Yep. Risha, I understand that we're not trying to come up with the most interesting architecture here. Yeah. But the task, as I understand it, is to determine whether two motions in a piece of text refer to the same real world entity, which means that the piece of solution here is that the dimensions refer to an entity in the first place. So I would probably have a pipeline architecture where the mm -hmm. first step is to try to determine whether the mention is. Yeah, you are completely right. I kind of switched and I defined this task in five different ways, I think, along the way, because mm -hmm. in, the, in the end, I just wanted to see whether you can, for two tokens, are you able to make a prediction of whether they are in a relationship or not? Because again, I sense that we do have some understanding of how to do classification at the sentence level, but uh, designing architecture for a little bit more specialized cases of pairwise predictions or span labeling, those are a little bit trickier. So uh, you're right. If we, if this was uh, really the task of entity linking, that would be way more pipeline. So the task here is just given two tokens, are they in some relationship or not? Okay, well, um, I will write this down. So don't need to take the photo, I, uh, you won't get it. Um, I did, we are out of time. I, there isn't much I wanted to uh, remind you of, uh, except uh, again, go, go uh, into question answering and summarization. We have introduced some different architectures over there. Uh, also different types of summaries. And what's important to for me that you review that how we did the automatic evaluation of obstructive summarization go over those, uh, you know, different alternatives to that. Okay, so we should stop here because we run out of time. And 
yeah, reminder, there is the feedback. I would appreciate that. Um, I also, if you allow me to just speak for one more minute, um, I want to um, advertise the seminar uh, I have, or I'm organizing for the next semester. So if you are interested in any of these topics around language models, here we are going to go in more, you know, advanced topics, some of which we have, you know, um, started last week, such as multilingual LLMs and multimodal ones, retrieval augmented generation. How this is going to work is uh, basically we are going to uh, spend um, two weeks on one topic. A PhD student will give a lecture on the topic, going into technical details of one aspect of that topic. And then the next um, next week, we are going to have a role playing paper discussion. Uh, so you all are finished this course, you can definitely take this seminar. I think uh, even undergrads like um, the completing this NLP course prepared you well for this seminar. And I think it's gonna be fun, very, there won't be homeworks. Uh, you will just need to show up uh, and participate in the discussion. That's gonna be the only thing you need to do uh, in the seminar. And yeah, I mean, I won't have an opportunity to speak to you uh, at the end of the exam because you will be uh, leaving at the different times, but I wanna thank you all for taking this course. As I said, this was my first time teaching it. So it was a valuable experience for me. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everyone who was coming here. You ask really good questions and I feel like you were really engaged. And I mean, I don't think I need to tell I'm very excited about NLP, but I also feel some of you have become, which really makes me uh, happy. Okay, good luck with the exam and ask any questions on Piazza or in the office hours uh, if anything is unclear during your preparation.